Bloomsbury in central London is home to one of the country's most famous national institutions. Established in 1753, the British Museum is one of the oldest museums in the world. Inside these walls, there are more than seven million objects spanning over two million years of global history and culture. At the top of these stairs is some of the greatest treasure ever found on English soil. More than a thousand years old, some call it page one of British history. It is the Sutton Hoo treasure, with this helmet at its centre. It is the prime example of a superb helmet. It's something that is completely extraordinary in Anglo-Saxon England. It's also at once familiar because it is a face and we can see it's a helmet and yet very strange, very other. It's a world of dragons and monsters and the face is just behind it in the darkness of the cheek pieces. That the helmet was ever discovered at all was down to the efforts of one woman, Mrs Edith Pretty, the daughter of a wealthy industrialist. She had lived at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk with her husband, a retired colonel, since 1926. Twelve years later, she was widowed with a young son and had withdrawn from polite society. Mrs. Pretty was interested in spiritualism, like a lot of people were in the 1930s. And we know that uh, she had a friend who was a medium and she used to go to meetings in Woodbridge uh, with spiritualists. Uh, and there is a story that uh, either her or a friend of hers had uh, visions of soldiers with spears walking around on the mounds, which she could see from her first floor window. Whatever the truth of these rumors, these earthen mounds were certainly intriguing. I think Mrs. Pretty was just curious about what was in, you know, in the mounds on her estate. She'd been to Egypt, and uh, also there were, I mean, there always are, rumours of gold in the mounds. But she did know a bit about archaeology, and I think really her curiosity was tickled. And she was wealthy enough to be able to open them and just have a look. Mrs Pretty contacted Ipswich Museum, and they in turn suggested an archaeologist named Basil Brown. He literally rolled up at her door one day and presented himself, and that's how it all began. Basil Brown had a real passion for investigating monuments. Assisted by Mrs. Pretty's gardener and gamekeeper, Brown carried out the delicate task of excavating the site. Just a few weeks of painstaking work on Mound One revealed the impression of a ship which had long since rotted away. Somebody else less skillful would have charged straight through that, but Basil's very clever excavation did actually reveal the impression of the boat left in the sand, the sort of shadow boat. The boat simply got bigger and bigger and bigger. This is as big as the Scandinavian ships, you know. So he was very aware, I think, during the excavation of the ship, that he was into something very, very special. Whispers about the discovery began to get out and soon the authorities were involved. Charles Phillips, a Cambridge academic, visited the site and was dumbstruck by what he saw. The burial chamber was yet to be opened and was clearly unrobbed. Phillips felt it was not appropriate work for one man, a gardener and a chauffeur. He took over the excavation, which was to become the richest archeological find in British history. It must have been absolutely overwhelming for the excavating team at that stage. I don't think they'd anticipated, how could they have done anything quite like this, because nothing quite like this had ever been found uh, in Britain before. There are other rich graves, but this was really quite spectacular. And uh, I think they were, in a sense, almost shell-shocked uh, by the rapidity and the extraordinary variety and wealth of the material that was coming out of this, uh, this burial chamber. It came like a bolt out of the blue. Suddenly, here's a window on a world, you know. 
this barbaric, splendid uh, burial, overflowing with extraordinary treasures. Weapons, golden garnet jewellery, and of course, containers, quite a lot of containers, imported silver, drinking horns, drinking vessels, everything. I mean, shoes, buckles. If you could put together a kind of life for an Anglo-Saxon king, there's not much there that you would actually want to add to it. By July 1939, it was obvious that this was a site of utmost importance. But the growing spectre of the coming war meant the excavation team was under immense pressure to work quickly. The whole time they were working, they were very aware that war could break out the next day. And so it was, you can almost look at it as a, as a form of a rescue excavation in a sense. So that it was quite amazing what they achieved. I'm sure part of the special nature of that sense of urgency was the growing realization as, as, as they excavated this extraordinary assemblage that it was here in some sense uh, an emblem of uh, English kingship. There was a very resonant uh, symbolic thing for the time in which it was excavated, absolutely. On the 28th of July 1939, the team made perhaps the most momentous discovery of all, the rusted pieces of an iron helmet. I'm standing right above the spot where the helmet was found. It was smashed into tiny fragments and that tells us that the helmet itself must have been rusted and corroded at the time that the burial chamber collapsed, which means that the burial chamber must have been a very massive and sturdy structure. It had to support the weight of the mound on top of it and survive long enough for the helmet to rust away. And then, of course, it all collapsed and the helmet was broken into tiny pieces. These pieces have been painstakingly put back together to form this terrifying helmet. Although it is made of iron, it was once covered in tinned bronze panels. This replica helmet shows how it would have glittered in battle. It was highly decorated with scenes of a horseman riding over a fallen soldier and these dancing warriors with their spears and semicircular headdresses. The face mask has human features, a cast bronze mouth, nose and eyebrows. Look closer still and you will see that each eyebrow ends in a boar's head with pointed tusks. And at each end of the crest there is a dragon head with sharp little teeth. The degree of detail in that face mask, the garnets that pick out the eyebrows, the little sort of toothbrush moustache over the mouth. I mean, all this stuff is quite extraordinary. It's, it's almost as though they are trying to present a portrait of the man who is behind it. And of course, it is extraordinary that when you actually wear the helmet or wear the replica, it also actually enhances your voice. It actually makes the voice echo and drop in tone so that that too would actually give the wearer some extra sort of persona, if you like. They're quite sinister, these helmets. The big question was, who would have worn it? The particular conditions of Mound One meant that there was nothing left of the person who was laid to rest there. You have to imagine the ship buried in the ground is like a container for water. So water percolating down through the mound would collect in the burial chamber in the boat and it would be quite acidic because it's filtered through this sandy soil and you have to imagine a body basically lying in what is in effect an acid bath and so the body and all the bones dissolved away over many years leaving only a few chemical traces behind so that's why no body or bone was discovered. There may not have been a body but the artifacts gave some strong clues as to whose grave this might have been. In this letter to Mrs Pretty, Thomas Kendrick from the British Museum suggests it was someone very special indeed. There is no doubt that the man in your barrow must have been a very important person and we are beginning to wonder if he was King Redwald of East Anglia. King Redwald had ruled in the early 7th century. 
If Kendrick was right, then it meant that the ship burial had taken place nearly 1,400 years ago. Well, if you look at all the assemblage together, and if you look at the contenders for the burial, you can make a personal choice. I mean, you can never say that this is the burial of X. But given the golden garnet jewellery, the assemblage, given the date of the coins, um, and given the possibility that the burial could have taken place within a decade of the, those coins coming together, say, in the mid 6 20s, then you could argue for Redwald. Almost all we know about King Redwald comes from this 8th century manuscript, The Ecclesiastical History of the English People, written by the Anglo-Saxon monk known as the Venerable Bede. Redwald has a particular place in English history because, according to Bede, a number of these early English kings held a special sway over the southern English peoples. They were kings who ruled other kings. And Bede says they held an imperium, which are the Latin word meaning a kind of uh, uh, empire, a wide rule. In Anglo-Saxon, this appears as Bretwalda or Brittenwalda. The lavishness of the grave, and even conceivably some of the symbolism of the artifacts, could suggest that it's him, that dating is spot on. Some of the things in the grave were incredibly valuable but they also had a significance over and above their material worth. This great gold belt buckle weighs just over 400 grams of gold, which new research shows was the equivalent of 300 Anglo-Saxon shillings. Now, what's even more significant about that is the fact that 300 shillings, we know from the law codes of the time, is the life price of a nobleman. It was the amount that had to be paid in compensation to settle the feud if a nobleman was slain. What this meant was that the man who was able to wear this great gold buckle would have been able to sit in a hall surrounded by noblemen, but with the price of the life of any single one of those simply sitting on his belt. The goods within this grave were certainly fit for a king. Nothing like a crown was worn by those early kings. The first example of what we would call a crown with kind of prongs comes from the 10th century. Then it was the sword and the helmet which defined the monarchy. This is an enormous amount of wealth that's going into the ground. Absolutely superb material. There is nothing anywhere else in this period to touch the quality of that jewellery. And yet this is something that this family, uh, the royal family in East Anglia, could afford to discard into the ground. Of course, it was an act of honour and homage to the dead man, but it also says, you know, we are so rich, we still have more of this behind. Even treasured heirlooms were placed in the chamber. The animal interlace patterns on the helmet suggest it was about a hundred years old when it was buried. What's more, there was an intriguing feature to its back. The helmet has a repair on it, so that suggests that it had a bit of use before it was put in the grave. It is impossible to know, finally, if this helmet was worn in battle. But although it is quite delicate with its silver work and garnet inlay, there is no doubt that this was a functional piece of armour. It would be possible to wear it as it's got nostrils so that you can breathe when you're wearing it. It's quite um, stifling actually to put the replica on, but it would be possible. And of course, you then have to wonder, did your king go into battle? There's no reason why it shouldn't have been worn and it would have made an amazing figurehead. We know that King Redwald fought at least once in the Battle of the River Idol. In his 8th century manuscript, Bede tells us that Redwald massed his troops and marched the 256 miles to Northumbria to face his enemy Ethelfrith in the year 616. Although Redwald defeated his enemy in the north, he lost his son Regan here in the battle. Because warfare was an aristocratic occupation, of course, the casualties were very heavy in the aristocracy if you lost. Redwald himself, conceivably, may have died in battle. We just don't know. At first sight, the grave seemed...